Okay, so good morning, everyone, um, or good afternoon, depending on your on your time zone. My name is Julien Rochette. I'm the director of the Ocean Program at IDRI, the Institute for Sustainable Development and International Relations, and I will have the pleasure uh, to facilitate this deep dive on the IC's uh, treaty uh, negotiations. So maybe some of you attended the previous uh, uh, virtual session this morning that highlighted the various impact of human activities on the ICs, and that explains why the international community decided to launch negotiation for uh, a legally binding agreement on the conservation and sustainable use of marine biodiversity in areas uh, beyond national jurisdiction. So the overall objective is of this negotiation is to establish a global regime uh, for the ICs through, for instance, uh, an international uh, mechanism for MPAs. But let's not forget that it's not only about conservations, but also about sustainable development and, and also equity. So, so far, uh, three negotiating sessions have been held based on a draft agreement. And the fourth session, which was postponed because of the pandemic, is supposed to be the last one, the final one. However, there are still many uh, issues on the negotiating table and, uh, and of course important efforts should be made um, if we want to meet uh, this deadline. So um, to discuss these uh, remaining challenges, we have the pleasure today to have with us six uh, uh, distinguished uh, panelists. Heidi Rodriguez first, uh, Vice Minister of Water and Seas in Costa Rica. Thank you very much to be with us, Heidi. Sophie Mirgo, uh, special, special Envoy for the Ocean at the Belgium Ministry of Environment. Bonjour, Sophie. Janice Mose, uh, Deputy Permanent Representative uh, at the Solomon Islands uh, Permanent Mission to the UN. Good morning, Janice. And also Alex Rogers, uh, Professor at Oxford University and Scientific Director of, of uh, Rev Ocean. Clément Moulalap, uh, uh, Legal Advisor at the Permanent Mission of Micronesia to the UN. And Rhys Pacheco, Executive Director of WSL Pure which is the conservation branch of the World uh, Surf League. So thank you, uh, uh, all of you, for uh, your participation. So during this hour, we will have first a dialogue uh, with uh, the different panelists. And then you, behind your computer, you will have uh, uh, the opportunity to ask uh, uh, some questions to uh, our different uh, speakers through the Q&A function of the Zoom application. I'm pretty sure that you are all now uh, experts of, uh, uh, of this technology. Um, Alex uh, Rogers, I would like to start with you, um, and so that you, you give us the scientific ba basis of, uh, of, uh, of the discussion. Could you please tell us what we know about the importance of the biodiversity of the ICs? Thanks, Julian, and thanks everybody for attending today. Um, well, the high seas comprise it well, covers about 43% of the Earth's surface, but represents something like 70% of the living space on Earth. So it's fantastically important in terms of, of uh, uh, habitat for, uh, for the bi biota of the entire world. Um, the upper ocean uh, of the high seas uh, represents about half of the ocean's primary production. Um, and it appears very uniform, but we've got to remember that it's very complex in terms of currents fronts and upwellings and so on. It's also uh, a place where uh, large amounts of marine life uh, migrate across. Some animals complete their life cycle in surface areas of, uh, of the high seas, such as most of our, our marine turtle uh, species, um, but also animals like whales, tuna, sharks, uh, billfishes, seabirds and so on, all use the high seas as part of their annual uh, life cycle and migration. These animals don't recognize the boundaries us humans place on the ocean. They use a whole ocean in the space of a year. In, in deeper water, uh, in the twilight zone between 200 and 1,000 meters, we have a fantastic diversity of animals specially adapted to these low light levels. Many of them are bioluminescent, many transparent. They have fantastic adaptations in terms of vision. This zone has now been realized as being very important in terms of drawdown of carbon into the deeper ocean where it's sequestered and stored. Below that, we know less and less about the deep water column, but the sea floor, which 
generally is between 4,000 and 6,000 metres out in areas beyond national jurisdiction is also not a uniform uh, ecosystem. It's covered in tens of thousands of sea mounts, underwater mountains, and holds some really amazing extreme environments like deep sea hydrothermal vents. Mm. And we also have the polar regions as well, which are another extreme environment. These areas are inhabited by a, a huge diversity of life. Even these kind of almost featureless muds, which sit on the uh, deep sea floor, are inhabited by a very wide range of small organisms, types of worms, types of mollusks, crustaceans, but a very high diversity of them. And then there are larger animals uh, moving across that seabed, such as sea cucumbers, scavenging fish, octopuses, and so on. And habitats like sea mounts are real biological hotspots. So they have a very high diversity of life associated with them, but they're uh, oases in the middle of uh, the ocean where many large animals come to feed and also host rich habitats, uh, for example, of cold water corals and deep sea sponges. And, and this diversity is not only important to, to maintain uh, ocean life, but uh, it also provides uh, ver various services to uh, human beings. And I'm thinking of this taste uh, to diagnose the coronavirus that was developed with microbes uh, from hydrothermal vents. And, and if I'm not wrong, Alex, many experts consider the ice as uh, uh, tomorrow's medicines, that's right? Absolutely right. Um, if you look at the record of, uh, of finding um, drugs and medicines from uh, life on Earth, you're something like two and a half or even more times likely to find useful uh, medicines in marine organisms than from terrestrial. And sponges and corals, uh, the group that corals belong to, uh, have found to be a particularly rich source of these types of uh, chemicals and it's not just medicines it's a whole range of uh, chemicals which are useful in terms of human well-being so uh, things which have been used in cosmetics for example as uh, uh, antioxidants and barriers to UV uh, damage to the skin um, and also useful industrial uh, enzymes as well. So another, another uh, reason to protect the EIC's biodiversity. Absolutely, and, and the vast biodiversity there just contains a huge wealth. I mean, you're talking about four billion years of evolution that's produced this diversity and, and diversity of biochemicals that we are yet to really tap into. Thank you very much, um, Alex. Um, Clement, Clement um, uh, Alex just illustrated the uh, exceptional biodiversity of the ICs, and I know that Micronesia and um, other states from the G77 would like to set up a regime that will combine both conservation but also equity. Um, do you think uh, uh, equity issues are currently uh, discussed enough uh, in this negotiation? Uh, and I'm thinking in particular of uh, 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 the aspects related to marine genetic resources? Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, you are quite right that Micronesia, as well as the rest of the uh, group of 77 in China, we consider the principle of equity to be a very important component for the BBNJ instrument. Um, and we have uh, advocated for this in the negotiations uh, when we talk about, uh, among other things, Article 5 on general principles and approaches as well as when we talk about uh, fair and equitable benefit sharing for MGRs, for marine genetic resources. Uh, so our groupings have emphasized this in different ways throughout the negotiations. We have encountered some resistance from other, uh, other delegations, uh, particularly from the developed world for various reasons, uh, but we continue to advocate for this. And we do think that we do have a solid foundation for the principle of equity in the convention itself, in UNCLOS itself. Uh, the, the preamble for UNCLOS talks about promoting the equitable and efficient utilization of the resources of the ocean. It talks about um, the realization of a just and equitable international economic order, which in particular takes into account the interests and needs of uh, developing countries. 
And there are many articles in the convention that address uh, equitable sharing and equitable access uh, to deep seabed resources, to fisheries, and even the transfer of marine technology. Uh, and so in our view, the sustainable use of the resources of the ocean must be governed by equity, uh, particularly for the needs and interests of developing countries. Um, and this is not just for marine genetic resources, it's also for area-based management tools, for how you conduct environmental impact assessments, and how you conduct capacity building and transfer marine technology. All of this should take place with a spirit of equity, taking into consideration the needs and interests of developing countries. And then kind of narrowing it down a little bit, uh, for Micronesia and other small island developing states, uh, we consider equity to be critical for the recognition of the special circumstances of small island developing states. We are a particular subset of developing countries, widely recognized in international law as having acute uh, economic and environmental vulnerabilities, as well as longstanding connections to the ocean and its resources. And so if we are to have an equitable approach, we do need to take into consideration the special circumstances of SIDS. And lastly, uh, we do think that while equity is an important component uh, for the sustainable use of resources, it's also an important component for the conservation of resources of the ocean. Uh, this notion of intergenerational equity that Micronesia and other Pacific small island developing states have been emphasizing in the negotiations. This idea that as we conserve and sustainably use BBNJ, we must keep in mind the, the needs and interests of future generations. Um, as we say in Micronesia, uh, we do not own the ocean and its resources. We borrow them from future generations. And we take this responsibility very seriously. Thank you. So we understand that for you, equity uh, uh, should be a kind of overarching principle in this future treaty and not only concerns on, uh, marine genetic resources, but it's broader than that and apply to fisheries, ABMTs, etc. Um, Micronesia is also a member of the Pacific Small Island uh, Developing States Regional Grouping, uh, as you mentioned. And, and uh, my question will be how are they and are you approaching uh, rights and interests of uh, indigenous peoples within the draft agreements? What are the, the key considerations for you? Yeah, so I just at the outset, I would like to emphasize that uh, neither I nor Micronesia are speaking on behalf of indigenous peoples. Um, indigenous peoples are their own groupings, they're their own peoples, they self-identify, they participate in their own ways uh, in these negotiations. Having said that, uh, the PCIDs have been in close discussions with indigenous peoples about how to reflect their rights and interests in the negotiations. And so in that sense, uh, PCIDs have, first of all, we've called for language throughout all major parts of the BBNJ instrument as well, including the institutional arrangements. Um, that recognize and incorporate the relevant traditional knowledge of indigenous peoples and local communities in order to implement the BBNJ instrument. Uh, we've uh, discussed uh, several different types of relevant traditional knowledge, uh, including traditional knowledge about uh, culturally significant uh, marine species, such as whales and sharks and sea turtles, some of which that Alex referenced, that range between areas beyond national jurisdiction and coastal waters. We have traditional knowledge about environmental management practices in coastal waters that could be best practices uh, for the high seas. And we also still have a strong tradition of instrument-free traditional navigation on canoes across the high seas that's still very active in the Pacific and that has uh, generated significant traditional knowledge about uh, areas beyond national jurisdiction. And then in terms of rights, and this is a key issue, in terms of the rights of the holders of traditional knowledge, uh, the Pacific states recognize uh, that when you seek and transmit and utilize this traditional knowledge, you have to do it in culturally sensitive ways that respect the rights of the holders of such traditional knowledge, including the right to free prior informed consent, as well as other rights recognized in the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And so toward that end, the Pacific SIDS, along with Australia, New Zealand, and Norway, we have proposed language for the preamble of the BBNJ instrument, uh, as well as for Article 5 on general principles and approaches that explicitly recognizes the rights of indigenous peoples and local communities and requires that such rights must be respected when you interact 
with these holders of traditional knowledge when implementing the BBNJ instrument. And we have similar language in other major multilateral environmental agreements that provide similar safeguards, including the CBD, the Nagoya Protocol, the Paris Agreement, and so forth. So we view these safeguards as very important, and we're open to working with our partners to make sure that we get some sort of uh, traction on them. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Clement. So we should certainly come back to these important issues during the Q&A sessions. But now uh, let me give the floor to uh, Riz Pachenko. Uh, Riz, first of all, could you please tell us a bit more about the World Surf League and, and the place of your organization in the, uh, the discussions on ocean sustainability? Thanks. Yeah, I realize I'm a little bit of an outsider here. Um, so the World Surf League, we say we put the world's best surfers on the world's best waves. Uh, we host professional competitions around the globe. Those locations are Brazil, Australia, Portugal, France, South Africa, um, as well as many other events in the US, Japan, and beyond. So truly hundreds of events around the world, um, the best surfers competing uh, to, to um, win the world title, uh, which we crown. Um, and we're more than just the sports league, we're actually uh, essentially a media company. So we're creating lots of content around this and our surfers have a far reach to their fans and a deep connection to their fans. So we have this really incredible platform and we like to use it to do good. I mean, as surfers, the ocean is much more to us than just uh, the place where we compete and the place where we surf. Um, you know, we recognize that it provides us with every other breath we take, that it provides us with food and jobs and so much more. And so we have this deep connection to it. Um, so we do feel this responsibility to protect it. Um, that's why we have WSL Pure, which is our 501c3 nonprofit organization, um, through which we're partnered with the Natural Resources Defense Council. And that relationship opened us up to the UN High Seas Treaty negotiations. I was very lucky to attend in 2018, I believe, with Lisa Spear of NRDC in New York City, get to witness some of the negotiations myself and understand them. And while most surfing takes place on the coast, like I said, we fully recognize the importance of the deeper connection to the high seas and that we need that to get to, um, you know, if we are going to get to 30 by 30, that we need the high seas in all of that discussion. Um, we were also lucky to uh, work with the Ministry of Belgium last year at the climate conference with their blue leaders work. And so I commend all the countries that are blue leaders already. Um, and Haiti, I actually got to speak with Carlos earlier this week. <laughs> He's a strong advocate um, for, for Costa Rica and the uh, on the uh, 30 by 30 negotiations. And so he was fantastic, but yeah, that's kind of where we are. And surfers, I would, I would say one final thing is we are activist voices. You know, there are examples around the world of surfers stepping up to protect their coastline, whether it was uh, in Australia, the way that the local surf community helped rally against some offshore drilling that was going to be really dangerously done or even recently surfers reaching out to me about a sewage issue in Denmark. Um, surfers are everywhere. They're around the world. Uh, they're young and passionate and excited, and they, they you know, want to engage in this work. But however, the ICs are pretty far away from, from the coastline and also from, from the average persons, I will say, and the negotiations are also very complicated, both from a scientific and policy point of view. So. According to you, how can we better connect the citizens to the ISIS uh, uh, challenges and particularly surfers, for instance? Totally. I, I readily admit that I get lost in some of the acronyms sometimes, um, <laughs> but I understand they're necessary. And I commend all of you for doing this work. It's really important work speaking up for, for the ocean. Um, we see our role as working with NRDC and others to translate that you know, complicated science and policy to our fans around the world so they can understand this and how do we rally them to be a part of this discussion. So with NRDC and a number of other organizations, we're actually launching a campaign. Um, it is live now at weareoneocean.org and it is a petition uh, for 30 by 30. So we are calling on our fans around the world across the sail uh, surfing organizations, but we've also engaged the sailing community. It's truly anyone who recreates in or loves the ocean can sign the petition. We're gonna be delivering that uh, to the Secretary General ahead of the UNCBD, which of course has been pushed, but we're ready for that uh, longer time frame in which to rally people. We're also encouraging people to send letters. And so what we've done in our role is try to translate this complicated policy down to you know what people really need to know, which is we need to protect 30% and I, say, I should say fully and highly protect 30% of our ocean by 2030. 
Um, and then from there, how can we help tell those stories and the successful stories of those countries that are leading, that are blue leaders like NRDC is working on? So even just this week, we had, a, like I said, Haiti, a conversation with Carlos, and we brought in one of our World Championship Tour surfers, Brisa Hennessy, who was born in Costa Rica, to have that conversation together to talk about what will this mean for surfers? What will this mean for indigenous communities, people who recreate and use the ocean? Because it truly needs to be equitable access protected for everyone so that we have a safe and healthy ocean for future generations. Very interesting, Rhys. Thank you very much. And you already make this uh, uh, as, uh, um, as a bridge with the CBD framework and the uh, 30 by 30 uh, uh, targets that could be, uh, could be adopted. Maybe we could also uh, uh, come back to that later. Thanks again. Sure, Let's continue um, uh, this deep dive with uh, Sophie Mirgo. Uh, Sophie is Special Envoy for the Ocean at the Belgium uh, uh, Ministry of Environment. So Sophie, um, IGC4 was supposed to be held last April, but it was uh, canceled because of the pandemic. But I imagine that you have uh, used this time for more, I would say, informal uh, uh, diplomatic activities. Um, so could you please tell us how governments currently talk to each other and try to advance the negotiations? Yes, merci, Julien. Um, so um, just to start with, with, with my feelings regarding this um, is uh, I remember that when we received a letter from, from the UN and from uh, the president, Ambassador Rina Lee, about postponing, possibly postponing at that time, it was, I think, two weeks before we were supposed to start. So it was beginning of March and we couldn't believe this. Uh, I think now you look back at that, you think, well, how could we not see this coming? And, and, and now we live in such a different reality. But at that time we were like, oh, come on, let's just go to New York. What, what could be the problem? We will, we will perhaps wear a mask on the plane, but it was really a different reality. Um, and now we are, as you also said, very um, able to go on Zoom and we are very used to this and it's, it's a very normal thing to do. But, but as little as a couple of months ago, this was another, we were in a completely different mindset. Um, and what we were, what we are trying to do, we're trying to work on two levels: on the on the formal level, let's say, and on the informal level. And I will I will start with the informal level. Um, together with uh, Costa Rica, uh, with Monaco, uh, but also with um, the High Seas Alliance, as well as the Norwegian Peace uh, Institute and uh, the Albert II Foundation of Monaco, we are organizing uh, High Seas Online Dialogues. Um, so we're actually meeting a little bit like this, but with, with uh, all interested uh, parties to talk informally about different, uh, different issues of, uh, of uh, the agreement. And we're trying to do this mostly to keep up the momentum. Um, like Reese said, um, w the worst that could happen is that we we are not able to keep this this level of enthusiasm that we somehow it, this falls through the cracks. This is a, one of the biggest negotiations ongoing uh, at the UN at this point, and so we we cannot lose this uh, uh, momentum. Um, so in in the worst case scenario, I would say these online dialogues would simply keep the momentum going, keep this this pressure on us uh, delegates from different uh, countries uh, and from uh, from uh, organizations uh, that are observers uh, at the UN to uh, maintain the same sense of urgency. Um, and then anything else that we can add would be a, a benefit and the optimist in me always thinks that there are pluses that can be won or that can be gained. And that would be that we, we need to clarify uh, what our positions are. I mean, I know that we, for many of us, we did this many times, but um, one, of, one of my esteemed colleagues once said that at the UN, um, repetition is not only allowed, it's actually mandatory. And so that's what, what I think is very useful that this keeps um, uh, clear to us what the different positions are. Um, I'm also thinking that this is important because once we will get the green light to have an IGC4, whenever that will be, we will need to hit the ground running we will need to be ready, uh, all delegations will need to be ready to dive into uh, the negotiations again and be in the same mindset that we would have been in, in, in March, April 2020. Um, if I am extremely optimistic, I could say that um, intercessional time and, and uh, also these high seas online di dialogues um, could uh, be um, um, a forum or a, a place where we could 
untie some of the, the remaining knots. Um, that would be a, a very, very big benefit if we would be actually one step further than we were um, in, in, in March, April 2020. Um, that would be um, a very good result. Um, how we want these uh, uh, dialogues to be is actually a safe place. We want to recreate a mood of earlier live meetings that we had, intersessional workshops, where people feel safe. I think, I mean, it's, it's amazing to see in these negotiations, we're almost all on first name basis and, and we consider each other colleagues, not merely uh, delegates from other uh, delegations. Um, and we want to recreate that atmosphere online to the best of our abilities. We have one session uh, next, um, next week. We are trying to have monthly sessions up until we have an IGC uh, four. Um, and then let's look at the more formal um, aspect uh, that would be uh, work within the, the, the Bureau of the Negotiation, um, as well as bilaterals that we have with the President. Uh, and um, we, I mean, we, we are working with, with sort of on moving territory um, because we don't know when the next IGC will be. And I have to apologize because my daughter woke up from her nap unexpectedly. <laughs> no problem. Thank you very much, Sophie. Um, Maybe we can um, um, uh, move on and. Um, bonjour. Um, maybe That's all can, right. I can I can take a second question. Uh, as yeah. well. <laughs> my, my second question, or uh, if you if you prefer, we will let you a few minutes with your daughter, and then we come back to you. Up to you. Okay, let's do that. Um, so um, let's move on to uh, from Belgium to the Solomon Islands uh, uh, with uh, with Janice uh, Janice Mose. Um, Janice, from the beginning of the uh, ICS discussion, specific states have always been very vocal. Um, I would like to know if you if you feel that you your voice is is really heard in us uh, in this negotiation phase. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you very much. Uh, so I, I began as a Pacific Small Island Developing States negotiator for the environmental impact assessment element, basically from the third intergovernmental conference uh, on the negotiations. So my observations are based on what has been discussed by my colleagues within the group that have been following this process for much longer than I have. And what has come to light is that um, the issues that the Pacific states have championed throughout this process have been heard pretty much 50-50. Um, some of the issues such as adjacency, stewardship, and traditional knowledge, which um, my colleague Clement had uh, spoken about earlier, they've been added to the draft text, um, though often in brackets still. Um, however, the Pacific States does remain concerned about the level of ambition that this text seeks to, uh, seeks to achieve. Um, whilst we see that this treaty is an opportunity to build on the provisions in the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea in order to uh, conserve our biodiversity on the high seas, we do see positions from delegations that are essentially uh, basically the same as what's contained in the UNCLOS. Um, and just just the current status quo. Um, another issue that we do remain concerned about is the level of decision making. Um, currently, the draft text that we have before us um, gives a lot of onus on the state parties to, to make decisions regarding activities on the high seas. But we in the Pacific Seeds are of the view that any global framework um, of this nature should also have a body for decision making that is also global in nature. Um, for us, we see this as important. It reduces the chances of forum shopping and inconsistencies on how the measures under this proposed instrument uh, will be implemented. Another issue we see is um, leaving, with leaving state parties responsible for implementation uh, is the issue of capacity. Um, for us in the Pacific, as SIDS, we acknowledge our limited capacities to implement some of the provisions and would largely rely on technical expertise that we will see being offered by, for example, a scientific and technical body under, under the, uh, this particular framework. So basically, from our perspective, we do see that um, we, we would want an, an instrument that we can uh, realistically implement, and then this would entail a lot of capacity building for us. So basically, I think it's, it's, it's half. We've been heard, and also some issues still need to be addressed. You, you mentioned the fact that you coordinate uh, environmental impact assessment discussions on behalf of uh, the Pacific, uh, the Pacific Seeds. Um, similar to the question posed by uh, to, posed to Sophie, how are these countries organizing and progressing in this uh, 
extended uh, intersessional period. Do you have any uh, informal or formal, uh, you know, collaborations to 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 advance your position and? Well, right now, um, I think it's still pre pretty um, still pretty informal, if you like. Uh, we 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 are trying our best to see if we can come to common positions with other de delegations that have similar views. Like, for, for example, in the environmental impact assessment, uh, we are at the moment trying to work with the CARICOM group to see where we can establish uh, cross-regional positions as we have the most similar positions within the draft text. But other than that, we are also working to reach out to other groups as well. Um, it's going to be important going forward that um, we were able to, to discuss and, and come to conclusions on a lot of the, uh, the tricky parts as well. Um, and to go, to go a little bit deeper, um, what, what are the important elements that you, you would like to see in this uh, environmental impact uh, assessment provisions in, this, uh, in the future treaty? What are the key, I would say, three things that you absolutely want to see in the treaty? Okay, so in terms of the most important elements uh, in the EI section, um, as, uh, there, there are several, but as you mentioned, in the interest of time, I will just stick to three. Um, we would want to see, firstly, uh, robust um, provisions on, on, the, on, on the triggers that, uh, on thresholds that trigger an EIA. Um, well, the, the Pacific SIDS group is of the view that Article 206, which speaks to thresholds that uh, trigger an EIA, uh, are, are essentially the floor and not the ceiling. So in order to move away from the status quo, we see that it should be set at a, at a higher stage than it currently is. Another issue for us is um, ensuring that adequate provisions are made around the issue of transboundary impacts. Um, we are island, large ocean states. And so um, we see, for example, that activities that take place, that take place in high seas pockets, for example, that are exclusively surrounded by a, the economic, exclusive economic zone, territorial zones of seas um, that due regard be given and to, to their views uh, in, an, a, a, in an impact assessment on any activity that happens in that particular space. And, and finally, I think one important uh, point, as I mentioned earlier, is decision making. Um, as alluded to earlier, we would want to see that the global framework uh, is, is, has decision-making that is done by a global decision-making body, ideally a, a conference of the parties to the agreement. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, uh, indication and precisions. Let's uh, go back to Belgium, uh, to Sophie. Sophie, I will have a second question for you, and let's move on from EIA to uh, ABMTs. I know that, Sophie, you coordinates the European position on uh, ABMTs. Could you please quickly describe um, our uh, uh, future MPAs regime could you look like very quickly from maybe from the designations to the management in a few words also yeah. I know it's quite complicated too. Um, so uh, first of all uh, we actually see three scenarios um, that we need to have some kind of uh, procedure developed for uh, for really when there is nothing in place uh, what I will call from scratch MPAs from the for the BBNJ agreement so where everything has to be built from scratch the second one is when there is already something in place. For example, I could imagine a regional fisheries management organization having some kind of area-based management tool uh, already in place, and but that this would be far from a holistic MPA. So in order to complement um, uh, that area-based management tool to, to, to make it an MPA, if we feel that that, uh, that is appropriate, that is a second scenario. And a third scenario is where, for example, you would have um, a regional seas organization that would already have uh, marine protected areas on the high seas, um, but that are only uh, valid for the members of that regional uh, seas organization. So what to do with, with those situations, how, how to get some kind of recognition without losing um, the, um, um, uh, the, 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 the same high standard that we uh, set for our BBNJ uh, MPAs. Um, what we uh, feel uh, that, that the agreement should entail is some kind of procedure um, that is uh, both ambitious and realistic. And I will uh, explain this very quickly. Um, so this procedure should have clear criteria for identification. There should be proposals. These made from uh, states or from groups of states. Um, these proposals should then be consulted upon. Uh, and this con consultation phase should be very 
very large and very uh, thorough and broad and all inclusive, including with NGOs, with regional organizations or other uh, sectoral organizations, for example. Um, then we would need uh, some kind of scientific check or assessment. And then uh, comes the, the time to take a decision. So that would be, there would need to be a decision-making um, uh, phase, uh, including on uh, a management plan. Uh, I'm calling this ambitious because it, we would go for, for uh, MPAs that include a management plan, but also realistic because um, there will be some time uh, that will go into the consultation phase. And there will be some back and forth, obviously, between the different the, the proponents and uh, the different uh, other uh, delegations that will be uh, consulted or even the organizations that are consulted. Um, the, so I'm, I'm, I'm saying realistic because it will not be like a in one year we will have, I don't know how many MPAs. Um, the thing is that we need this treaty and we need to have an ambitious MPA procedure because we don't only need to make those 10% targets, but also as Reese uh, alluded to, uh, the 30% goal, which uh, there is a growing uh, consensus around and which we hope to, to, to get accepted into the CBD um, uh, the, at the next uh, CBD COP. Thank you very much, Sophie, and, and, uh, and congratulations to be able to uh, uh, both uh, discuss these very technical issues and take care uh, uh, of your baby uh, at the same time. Um, I would like now to uh, give the floor to the last panelist, uh, Heidi Rodriguez. Um, Heidi, you are uh, Vice Minister of Water and Seas in Costa Rica, a country that is well known for uh, its uh, biodiversity conservation policy. Um, what does this discussion inspire for you? Would, would you have any comments uh, following the previous uh, talks from Alex, uh, Clement, uh, Rhys, uh, Sophie and Janice? Hi, hi, good morning everyone. Um, yes, I think I'm in, the, in, in, a, in a very difficult position right now because I agree with all of you. And um, I guess my, my role here is to to try to explain how are we going to do it from Costa Rica to translate all the science that, that we already know and all the connections between uh, the economic exclusive zone and areas beyond national jurisdiction uh, in order to actually push um, this, this treaty um, as far as, as, as we can. Um, Costa Rica is, is a leader in conservation. We, we have almost 30% uh, of our land territory uh, protected, but you know that we are 92% um, ocean as well, but we only have less than 3% of, of our economic exclusive zone uh, under protection. So we have very ambitious plans um, for the next years to actually work in developing marine special planning in the economic exclusive zone, working towards um, blue economy, um, monitoring, um, law enforcement, uh, governance uh, tools for coastal communities to actually highlight the benefits of protection but we are not gonna be able to do any of this or to have a real impact uh, if we don't think beyond our economic exclusive zone. So for us, it is, it is vital to have the discussion about what we are doing in our borders, knowing that we only have one ocean and the ocean doesn't know about borders, but knowing that, that we have some um, some actions that we can we can do in our economic exclusive zones but that we also need to to talk and work beyond that borders and in that sense um i i i feel very um uh connected with sophie when when she she was saying about how 2020 changed it um, our way of seeing everything. And I think it's amazing that we can, we can be here at different time zones discussing what it's a passion for, for us with our family around us as well. So um, I think now we have the, the opportunity to actually connect all the dots. We've been doing this in, in separate uh, parts. We've been seeing biodiversity in one side. We've been seeing BB, uh, okay, areas beyond national jurisdictions. 
we've been seeing climate change. This is the time that we have to actually connect all these dots. And Costa Rica has, has reason, as Sophie mentioned, uh, we are working with friends in, in having this high ambition coalition for, for nature and people. And what we want to achieve is a, is a, is a movement of countries uh, in, in the post 2020 um, framework to actually protect the 30% of land, but the 30% of, of the ocean as well. And here, um, talking about marine protected areas in, in areas beyond national jurisdictions are, are important topics. So, so I, I just want to, to make a, um, um, a highlight here about the importance for us um, to actually have a very sound chapter on marine protected areas, as well as environmental impact assessment. Okay, that's my son waking up as well. So <laughs> just give me one sec. Sure, thank you very much, uh, Heidi. Uh, maybe a, qu a question before we take the um, uh, questions for, from the audience. Um, I would like to, uh, to ask you a question for all of you. Feel free to reply or not, but um, um, the thing is that um, when I teach uh, the IC's uh, negotiations to, to students in France, uh, they're always very surprised that climate change is not a pillar of the, of the negotiations. How would you explain it and uh, how, how to make sure more broadly that climate change challenges are anyway, in a way or another, integrated in the, in the future treaty? Maybe Heidi, if you want, and then the other panelists. Yes, um, again, I think this is the opportunity to, to connect all those uh, dots. Um, here, more than, than ever, working in an international level, cooperation will be vital if we want to tackle not only the, the COVID crisis, but the, the real and the greatest crisis that, that we are going to face, which is climate change. So um, although climate change has not been part of um, like extensive um, uh, discussion during the, the BBNJ process. I think that we are doing that in other, in other um, scenarios. For example, the, the COP25 actually gave us um, an important space to talk about the link between climate change and the ocean. And now we are developing um, a dialogue process um, on how we can um, identify actions related with the ocean and climate change. And here, um, as Costa Rica, in, in our submission, we talk about the importance of, of, of um, um, ABNGs to, to actually talk about the ocean as a solution for climate change. And nature-based solutions are going to be key for the next, the next years for, for us. So um, I think that talking about MPAs and environmental impact assessments without talking about climate change is going to be really stupid. <laughs> we should talk about that um, if, we, if we are thinking about five years from now, 10 years from now, 15 years from now, from now and how all these changes are going to modify the, the, the ocean and are going to modify and impact the communities that depend on the ocean as well. Thank you, Aileen. Uh, I will give the floor to Sophie uh, so that she can give us uh, uh, some uh, elements regarding the negotiations. But first of all, I would like to give the floor to Alex um, uh, about, this, um, uh, about this issue. I mean, the, the interrelations between the ICs issues and climate change issue from a scientific point of view. What, what's your feeling with, with that? Um, well, my, my feeling is that the ocean was really neglected in terms of the whole climate change uh, discussions at, at UNFCCC and uh, even within the uh, IPCC for a long time. So part of this may be a, a historical uh, issue. Um, uh, I think recent reports from, for example, the uh, Prime Minister's High Level Panel on a Sustainable Ocean Economy show that the ocean can play a really significant role in climate change mitigation. And I, I actually prefer to call it climate disruption uh, mitigation because that's what it is. 
Mm. Um, uh, and um, you can think about, uh, even though uh, climate change may not be specifically incorporated within the, the BBNJ agreement as strongly as it should, and it may be because people feel that that is, the, you know, the business of UN uh, FCCC. Um, uh, if we end up with a strong agreement, you can see measures being taken through the BBNJ agreement that will help us with climate change mitigation. For example, placement of high seas MPAs, which are specifically or at least partly there uh, to protect the uh, carbon sequestration function of the ocean. Uh, sustainable food production, uh, which has a relatively low uh, CO2 uh, footprint compared to, say, terrestrial uh, meat production, uh, is another area. So I think there are several areas where it, if this uh, agreement is successfully made, then uh, there will be ways to use it uh, to help in this uh, um, climate mitigation. Thanks a lot, Alex. Sophie, please. Yes, I think actually the origins of why these are two separate worlds are quite boring uh, and found in, 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 in the UN system where we simply had one forum based in New York. See, she finds it very boring as well. Um, <laughs> she's yawning. Um, um, where we had one forum that was discussing uh, high seas issues based in New York uh, with, with a bunch of, of, of uh, I would say, traditional... Um, uh, law of the sea uh, lawyers or jurists and there were completely different people working in a completely different um, organizational structure uh, in another side of the UN uh, and, and, and meeting at other places and other, under another structure another secretariat um, who were dealing with climate change and I think actually the the blue cop which was held in in Madrid was a point where uh, both worlds gathered and where uh, and where the people from those different worlds gathered and this was actually instrumental right before an IGC4 and the last IGC in order to to join those both worlds in the actual agreement as well. Thanks, Sophie. Uh, a comment from Clement uh, before we open the uh, Q&A session. Clement, please. Uh, yes, thank you very much. Uh, just to build on, uh, on the folks before me, I agree that there's been a siloization or a bit of a fragmentation in how the international community deals with climate change issues and ocean issues. Um, but uh, despite that, uh, the Pacific SIDS and other delegations have tried to get targeted references to climate change and ocean acidification in the BBNJ instrument in all the major parts uh, of the text. Um, so as a general principle slash approach, um, but also in the ABMT's part, um, when we're talking about objectives and criteria, um, but also in terms of cumulative impacts for EIAs, um, and even for um, capacity building and transfer marine technology, the sort of information uh, dissemination and awareness raising about uh, climate change and ocean acidification. So we're hopeful that we'll have these sort of targeted references that we can build on in the future. Um, not just within the BBNJ instrument, but also in other processes. And I think Alex uh, kind of mentioned a little bit about uh, the lack of proper attention given to ocean issues in the climate change uh, sphere. Um, but there's a bit of a shift these days because the UNFCCC uh, has an ocean dialogue that's supposed to take place in the next uh, SUBSTA meeting for the UNFCCC that's supposed to focus on climate change and ocean. And so the Pacific states and other delegations have been uh, trying to raise the issue of, uh, of uh, BBNJ, among other things, in that climate dialogue. So the more we work on these interlinkages, uh, the better off we'll be, I think. Thanks. Thanks, uh, Clement. Please keep the floor. We start the uh, Q&A session. Uh, uh, and Clement, I have a, a question for you about uh, uh, equity issues that you already uh, addressed. The question is, how can we warrant it that every nation, whether it's a coastal nation or not, get their fair uh, share of the profits that other countries are getting from the ICs? How would you see that, I mean, equity in the broader sense? Yes, uh, so I think this is a particularly important for uh, marine genetic resources and the sort of structure that we'll put in place in the BBNJ instrument for benefit sharing. And so it's been very important for the group of 77 in China in particular uh, to push for fair and equitable benefit sharing. 
take into consideration all the needs and interests of all countries, um, particularly the developed countries. But we also recognize, as the preamble of the convention recognizes, uh, the needs of uh, landlocked countries um, uh, and other uh, non-coastal states, or geographically disadvantaged states. Um, all these different states, uh, these different states parties to the convention have rights to different aspects of the marine environment and the resources thereof. And so when we design the benefit sharing regime for marine genetic resources under the BBNJ instrument, um, it needs to be in a fair and equitable manner. Um, and this will require, among other things, uh, in, in my view, uh, proper traceability or track and trace of the marine genetic resources involved so that we know where things come from. Um, and we also need to have robust institutional arrangements in place that will allow for the participation of all these different subsets of groups uh, to make sure that they get uh, uh, proper benefits uh, from uh, the marine genetic resources. Um, but the bottom line is, um, even if you're not, for example, a coastal state, you do have entitlements to the ocean and you need to participate in the benefit sharing regime. Thanks. Thanks, Clement. Um, Rhys, a question for you. Um, how can we engage the general public in treaty conversation uh, that are by nature very complex and difficult to understand? Again, a question for you about the involvement and awareness raising uh, issues uh, and the yeah, involvement of, uh, of the citizens in these negotiations. Yeah, well, um, I think that already, you know, what NRDC did by bringing us into this conversation was really helpful because we speak directly to consumers and, and fans around the world. Um, I don't know if I hit it before, but we, we have surfers in all of your countries here. Um, I did a little bit of homework just to make sure that there are waves that can be surfed in Belgium. Um, there are waves, of course, uh, all across the Pacific. There are waves everywhere. And so there are surfers everywhere. And those surfers, you know, are not just surfers, but they're fisher people, they're sailors, et cetera. Um, so we really see it as our opportunity and our responsibility to educate them about this. So I think that to the extent that the work that you're all doing um, to promote uh, this conservation work, how can you partner with those nonprofit organizations in your home countries uh, to help advance this agenda? Um, and, you know, we're just one example of many who are trying to help advance this agenda. And hopefully together we can we can pave the way at the UN level and get this agreement of, you know, at least what we're shooting for is 30 by 30 and then, you know, flow the work out equitably from there. Um, that's really the way we see our role is, you know, translating that to our fans. And I do think that with COVID-19, um, you know, it has changed things dramatically. Normally our in-person events are a massive opportunity to reach a lot of people. Um, but we also have an incredible, you know, digital impact and we have, you know, tens of millions of followers around the world and fans who engage with our content and our fans. So, um, it's an opportunity for us to reach them through content now. And just, we're doing a lot more of this over zoom, but we're also creating more content activating online. And so we're going to lean into that heavily through the rest of the year. And then as hopefully things settle back into normal or hopefully are built back better as the UN has been saying, um, we'd love to see more opportunity for us to engage. And a, a quick note on the climate thing, um, you know, that discussion is super important. And I think that, you know, the, the way we look at it from the surf community, just if I can represent briefly is, you know, from the ocean and cryosphere in a changing climate report, I mean, the, in their opening statement, they said the ocean has been taking the heat. And we've been seeing that, you know, we've, we've seen that we know the oceans absorb more than 93% of um, all the excess warmth in our atmosphere. And so uh, we as surfers are seeing that. And that's why you're seeing us speak up. So it's inextricably, inextricably linked. Um, so we're, we're here for this discussion. So you, you raise also the ocean voice uh, in the climate cup yourself, for instance, do you participate to the climate oh. change cup? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I've, I, I, um, our specific engagement actually is through the UNFCCC. Uh, the World Surf League was one of the first signatories to the Sports for Climate Action Framework. So ourselves, IOC, um, some football clubs, uh, World Sailing, a number of organizations have stepped up and said that sports organizations have a role in communicating this back to our fans and our stakeholders. So uh, myself, I'm helping uh, with the working group there are five working groups on the different principles and I'm helping with a working group on communications with Dale from the forest green rovers, which is an incredible football club that has really done incredible work to be more sustainable. So we're trying to help translate the work that we're doing, share that with all sorts of sports organizations of various sizes and empower them to share that 
message with their fans. Um, we think that the sports for climate action framework is a really important part of all of this. We all have a role to play and we, we want to play that role. Thanks a lot, Chris. Uh, let's move from uh, sport to scientific organizations with a, a question for you, uh, Alex. Uh, in the preceding session, Ambassador Janine Felson said that it's extremely important to raise ambitions that the voice of the scientific community is heard. How can we better enlist scientists to engage, engage in the BBNG discussions? And uh, if I may complete, do you think that we lack of scientists in this discussion? Um, well, uh, I think there has been a, a wide range of scientists actually involved in uh, BBNJ discussions, but very much uh, on the periphery. Um, so mainly at side events and um, surrounding dialogues uh, around the actual negotiations. And I don't think there's any lack of scientists who are really willing um, to assist with these negotiations and really help people to understand the scientific issues around uh, the three major aspects of the uh, negotiations. But maybe uh, national delegations uh, can actually tap more into uh, their own scientific expertise in these areas to help them uh, understand uh, the issues that are at stake. Thanks, uh, thanks uh, very much, uh, Alex. We, we have four minutes left, uh, and I have a question that I'm sure uh, Heidi, Janice, and Sophie can uh, can can reply to and address. Um, we have heard that 2020 was supposed to be the super year for the ocean, and and you all mentioned uh, the need to connect the dots. How do you see the connections between the BBNG and the other effort in the uh, in the effort in the other uh, international fora? like uh, SDGs, for instance, uh, the CBD post 2020 framework, uh, etc. Maybe uh, Sophie? Yeah, this was indeed going to be a, a, the super year, the year of the ocean. Um, so, um, well, um, we think that um, it's, it will be important to have uh, the government on board for a number of different targets that we want to reach. And we see in particular a very big link between uh, the BBNJ uh, discussions and the CBD discussions because, because one needs the other. So the BBNJ discussion needs, uh, or sorry, the CBD discussion needs uh, the BBNJ instrument to be there in order to be able to have that target even of 10%. But even more for the 30% and vice versa. Uh, the CBD needs BBNJ to ask for realistic or realizable targets uh, because otherwise we're just talking in vain. Thanks, thanks a lot, Sophie. Uh, Janice, um, um, the relations that you can see between the BBNG uh, negotiation and uh, SDGs uh, related issues. Uh, thank you. So, um, I mean, the ocean is already uh, an SDG goal, um, and it's 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 been on the radar for 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 quite a while as well. Um, it's just simply a matter of ensuring that you know what is done in this particular forum and where we link it to the targets and the indicators under the SDG 14 goal. Um, it's it's very important so that you know you know as mentioned earlier by um, previous speakers that connecting these dots is is very important. This whole operating in silos is. Is, is not sort of uh, beneficial in the longer term. We need to see this holistically where it links with climate change, where it links with sustainable development. I mean, to be honest, uh, coming from uh, Pacific small and developing states whose um, economies are largely reliant on the ocean, um, sus developing sustainably will require healthy oceans. And this is very, very important, not just for us, but for, for, all, for, the, for the world as a whole. So thank you. Thank you. Um, the final word for you, Heidi. Thank you. You always put me in a very difficult position here. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think we, we still have time to make this the super year for biodiversity and for the ocean. Um, again, having the opportunity to discuss all these issues uh, without traveling from one place to another, adding more CO2 to the atmosphere. I think that's an excellent uh, starting point. Um, and definitely, um, I think we all agree that what we are looking for is 
um, having very productive ocean, uh, healthy ocean, and resilient ocean. And in order to do that um, and to connect with the biodiversity, we not only need to translate uh, science into policy, but also economics, numbers into policy. We need to make clear that uh, protecting one area will benefit uh, communities, will benefit the ecosystem. And, and that discussion, we can, we can continue with that discussion in, in online, doing this. If, if we can keep the momentum during this year, talking about the things that, that we have been discussing inside the BBNJ Treaty, um, trying to find the common points and, and the, the basis, the structure that we want and that we need to see in the, in the treaty. Mm -hmm. um, I think that will make this a super year as well. So let's, let's try to keep the hope and, and to, to, to move this forward, um, even if it's in a different way and just welcome the changes. Um, I, I do believe that we are moving um, in a different way, but we still want the same. And we still believe that the ocean can be the solution and is the solution. The, the ocean and nature will, will heal itself. Uh, um, the, the question is, are we humans are, are going to let them do their, their work? So I, I, I do think this is a great opportunity for, for all of us. Thank you very much, Heidi, for this uh, uh, optimistic final, uh, final word. Um, it's 2.30, it's now time to close this uh, deep dive session, and I would like to uh, thank our uh, panelists for their contributions. Thank you, Heidi, Sophie, Janice, Alex, Clement, uh, uh, and Rhys. Uh, thanks also uh, to all of you who attended the session. Thanks uh, also to the Dream Team uh, behind the scene, uh, staff from the World Economic Forum, as well as Peggy Callas, and Lisa Spear, and you know that the Virtual Ocean Dialogues continues all, uh, all this week. So enjoy, take care, and bye-bye. A bientôt.